Okay, good morning. Good morning. Oh, wow, well, thanks. Um, so we have three talks today, and but first I have a joke, okay? So, there is, in an airplane, there's a priest, a boy scout, and the world's smartest man, and a pilot. So, the plane's about to crash, so the pilot goes, all right, there's only three parachutes and four of us, so I'm gonna take a parachute, because I got my wife and kids. So the pilot jumps out of the plane. And the worst one is made the Boy Scout and the priest are like, well, the worst one is made goes, okay, I'm really smart, so I need to help the world. So he takes, he takes it and jumps out. And then the, world, the priest goes to the Boy Scout, okay, you're young, you have a life to live, I live my life, go ahead. So the Boy Scout goes, oh, don't worry, the world's smartest man just took my backpack. <laughs> but, um, okay. <laughs> On that note, we have first is Cassidy. It says, why foreign languages aren't so foreign? The good up of Cassidy Schrobe. A couple of years ago, I went to church in Manhattan, and it was a great experience. But as I was about to leave, this woman came up to me, and she seemed to have something really important to tell me. Her face was really urgent, but I couldn't understand anything she was saying, not a word. And I never will. Because she only spoke Spanish, and despite many years of force-fed Spanish classes, I only knew English. And it, even though I know that she probably got along in her own community just fine only knowing Spanish, and of course I got along fine in my own community only knowing English, there was a place not even a hundred miles away from my own home that our communities collided, and I experienced one of the greatest language barriers that I ever have. Now, back up a few months, and I had just finished my last ever Spanish class, or so I thought. I was so excited to be done with such a useless language that I was never going to use in my life, and I was really excited to start taking Latin, because that, was, that made a lot more sense to me. But you see, the thing is, both of these experiences that I just told you aren't that uncommon in the United States. There are, there are 37.6 million Americans who are native speakers of Spanish, not of English. Business Insider has reported that Spanish isn't a foreign language anymore. But what is foreign here is the idea that English speakers, especially American English speakers, should be learning other languages. I know I'm not the only one who felt like in middle school and elementary school Spanish classes that I was never going to use that. And somehow the birthright of English language nativity makes us immune to the global necessity of learning other languages and learning how to communicate with people who don't know ours. And I'll admit, it kind of makes sense. I mean, English is arguably the most pervasive and powerful language in the entire world. A couple years ago, I had the opportunity to spend about a week in Germany. A couple days of that was spent with a German host family, and I got to go to school and do all the community stuff with them, and it was great. I started picking up some phrases from just being around people, being around Germans, and I went home, or to my host home, and I started trying to try out those phrases. My host dad stopped me, and he was like, what are you doing? What's the point? There is no point to you learning German. Everyone here speaks English. And he told me about his friend who had come from some English-speaking country to Germany, lived there for like 10 years, and didn't speak more than a couple simple phrases of German. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought, that guy must feel like he's missing something. Because I felt like I was missing something in Germany with basically no knowledge of German, when I couldn't understand the conversations around me or a lot of the signs and advertisements. When I had to stop a conversation a couple lines into it because I couldn't continue it in German and I had to switch to English. It was really difficult, it was frustrating, and it was a lot like the frustration that I had felt in New York. So because of all of these experiences, I decided that I was going to learn Spanish. I enrolled in a um, really intensive immersion program with mostly filthy rich preppy kids. And I worked really hard and I learned the language. 
Now, I don't want you guys to get that. I want to try to convince you guys to spend that kind of time, money, energy, learning the language right now. That's not the point. But I do want you to know this. I was really worried coming back, that coming out of that immersive environment, that I wouldn't be able to keep up with my Spanish skills, that they would deteriorate because I didn't have the opportunities to practice. But I found so many opportunities right here in our own little community. And I don't think anyone would consider this area ethnically or linguistically diverse by any means. But I talk to native speakers every single day. I practice Spanish every day and my skills have improved. There are so many more people and opportunities to, to practice with, to, to see that Spanish especially and even other languages really aren't foreign after all. And this is true all across the country. According to the Census Bureau, about 80% of Americans speak English in their own homes. But that leaves about 20% of Americans who don't. And that number is really significant. Just for context, African Americans make up 13% of the United States population, according to the census. And before 1960, uh, Hispanic immigration, or Spanish-speaking immigration, accounted for less than 5% of all foreign-born Americans. Now, that number has grown to be over 50%. This comes from many different um, waves of immigration, including Puerto Rican immigration after World War II, Cuban immigration after the revolution in 1959, as well as just generally a huge wave of Latin American immigration starting in 1970 and continuing through the present day, that Latin American immigration is still growing, according to the National Research Council. And the United States, because of all of this, is expected to be the largest Spanish-speaking country in the entire world within the next 50 years. I just want to repeat that. The United States of America is expected to be the largest Spanish-speaking country in the entire world within the next 50 years. So what I want to encourage you to do is just reconsider. Reconsider your ideas of foreign language learning. Reconsider what you think foreign means. And definitely reconsider politicians and public figures who suggest that Spanish-speaking or any other language speaking for that matter is an American because to me it's the most American thing there is. Thank you. I'm gonna do a dandy yesterday. That is cool. Another round of applause for Cassidy Schroeder. So before our next speaker, I want to ask you guys some couple questions. So, what is the stupidest animal in the jungle? A polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, what kind of bagel can fly? A plain bagel. <laughs> Alright, so a toothless termite walks in, into a bar and asks, the, and asks, is the bartender here? Think about that one real, real hard. Toothless termite is the bartender here. All right, you guys don't understand. All right, so next is Nicole Gramco with her talk of why I dress the way I do. So give it up for Nicole. young and when I was eight years old actually or around that time I dressed completely like any other eight-year-old would I wore skirts and flowers and I shopped wherever we shopped at when we were eight I think justice right or limited to um, <laughs> and I just basically wanted to dress like any other girl what any other girl would want to dress like um, one time I was in the store and this jacket just automatically attracted to me. Um, it was this Letterman jacket and I've seen nothing like it before. I never knew what a Letterman jacket was. I didn't know that it was for 
uh, like varsity in high school or college, but I was somehow really attracted to it. Um, when I put it on, I it felt so masculine to me, and it felt so different, and it made me feel it made me feel different for the first time, and it made me feel rebellious, and I love that. I loved feeling rebellious, and it made me feel just badass, and um, it was. It was, it was great. I, I loved it. Um, so then I, um, a plaid outfit that my step great aunt gave to me um, is this one. So she gave me this a few years ago and I would have never, I don't know why, I can never understand why she gave it to me. It's probably one of the most wackiest outfits ever. Um, she wore this when she was a sophomore English teacher in Bloomfield, and she wore this in the 70s when she taught English. So, <laughs> uh, she, it was just, when I wore it for the first, I, I, I never understood why she gave it to me. It was like completely wacky, but when I wore it, it automatically just gave me the feeling of this vintage hip teacher from the 70s, and um, <laughs> I guess I like to feel that way. It was an interesting character, and it was, I mean, it definitely uh, reminded me of her tremendously, and it still does, um, and it's still very special to me. Um, so yeah, just, it gave me that vintage, uh, old soul feel to me. Um, these outfits, and this is just two of the many, represent uh, the characters that I am all made up of. And there are many, many characters, and there would be way too many outfits to bring in today that uh, represent every single character. And also there are outfits that haven't even been created yet because there's even more characters to create in my life. I'm sure there is. Um, so these outfits, though, represent a, a turning point in the way I think, in the way I behave, and the way I act. And it just doesn't represent a turning point in my style, but also in my growing and in my life. Um, through exploring and creating different outfits and having fun with them and wearing them, I have learned so much about myself. Um, I've learned to love myself like I've never have before. And uh, I've learned to be confident. And uh, I never, I, I also learned to never limit myself and never put myself in a box and never define myself. So uh, with dressing, and with expressing yourself through clothing, uh, you can gain uh, a lot of confidence. It teaches you an incredible amount of confidence and, and self-love. Um, you don't care what people think of you, and that's what's important. You should not worry about what other people think of you. Uh, when I'm completely alone in my room, just in my closet, and I have all of my clothes near me, and all of my different outfits, and all of my different characters, um, I'm completely feeling myself. That's a time where I feel so much uh, at ease and so much comfort uh, because it's just with myself and it's just me in my closet. So uh, at this time I can create, I have the freedom to create any outfit that I want. Um, and then let's say I create an outfit or wear an outfit the, la the night before or the weekend before school starts and, uh, and then I will wear it to school the next day. Um, that confidence and comfort that I feel in my closet will harness over into the next day and uh, I will feel completely, um, you know, ready to take on the day. It's the, I don't know, just, I, I know what I love and I know what, I know that I love what I'm wearing and I know that I love my outfit and uh, that attitude that I don't care what other people think and I love what I'm wear wearing, we'll carry on through the next day, and um, perhaps that confidence carried 
throughout me every single day because I continue to wear what I want and I continue to care, not care what other people think. Um, so this feeling, um, you know, this feeling, it's, it's just all what I need. That's it. me loving myself, me being confident, that's, that's all I need. Um, also, dressing in these cool, like, unique clothes, it's just fun. It's just simply fun. Um, I've, I, I wouldn't have <laughs> as much fun in my life if, if there were no wacky clothes that I could wear. Um, I'm an actor, so I love playing characters. Um, I like <laughs> all the character. All characters are so unique, and I, I, I love I love playing with them. I fall in love with every character that I play. But uh, I have multiple moods and characters inside of me. I'm a bunch of characters mushed up into one personality, I guess. Or I I don't know. I. <laughs> uh, all of my characters are just mushed inside of me and I, I get to play these characters every single day. I get to wear what I want um, and I think that's, you know, every single day and I think that's what's fun about it. Um, I also believe that it's the playing characters and playing whatever character you want, um, so that you don't have limits and you don't have any borders. You're not putting yourself in a box. Um, so lastly, uh, my clothes have really good reminders. Um, my step great aunt who uh, got me the, gave me this uh, really cool jacket from when she was uh, young, younger. She is, uh, she unfortunately passed away last April. Um, she meant so much to me. She was a very intelligent, strong, uh, caring, loving woman. And, um, and unfortunately, um, she passed away. But um, on the good side of things, I inherited most of her clothing. And I am incredibly thankful for that because every day I have a reminder of uh, who she is. I have a reminder of her and who I strive to be because she is my role model and my style icon, of course. Uh, she always had such a wacky sense of humor and she was very interesting and just a wacky taste in movies and music and uh, Oh, we have similar interests too. That's why we got along so well. Um, and obviously, she had clothes to match. Uh, so I, so every day, I get to wear uh, some kind of her clothing, and uh, it reminds me of her, and it serves as a great reminder. Um, so, basically, expressing yourself has taught me so much and has been, uh, expressing myself through my clothing has taught me so much uh, about um, just life and, and self-love and self-importance. And uh, I would have never been the same person I am today um, if it hadn't been for clothes. Um, and it's so funny because clothes are such a materialistic thing, yet they actually represent a, a huge part, and they helped me grow as a person. It's incredible how I uh, how I owe so much uh, gratitude toward uh, materials. <laughs> but um, so uh, self love is incredibly important. Um, I always struggled with loving myself, but uh, through clothes. I, in personal expression, I learned to combat it, and um, I've learned so much uh, about myself, and I've learned to embrace all those crazy characters inside of me, um, and 
I never ever put myself in a box and I never limit myself because the minute you limit yourself is the minute you just become sad, I think. I don't know. I, I could never live in a world where I feel limited. So through my clothes, I never ever limit myself. Uh, people are always trying to find their style or to find themselves. The truth is you have to create yourself and you have to create your own style. You can't be made of one personality. You can't be made of one mo mood. You can't be made of one side. You are everything. You are a whole bunch of different sides. I know I am, and so I'm guessing everyone else must be too. So um, follow your heart <laughs> and never ever limit yourself. Thank you. Okay, give it up for Nicole just one last time. Nice job. Okay, before our next person comes up. So there was two mice chewing on a film roll, and the one mice says, I like the book a lot better. Okay. <laughs> Have you ever heard about the marriage between the two antenna? The ceremony was okay, but the reception was amazing. All right, so for our next and last talk for today, uh, we have Lauren Platts with her talk, Investment in Education Helps the Middle Class. So give it up for Lauren. Hey guys, so what do you think is so great about the American economy? Maybe it's prosperous, maybe it's booming, maybe it's opportunistic. Unfortunately, that's not really the case. It may have been at one time, but currently, the United States economy is not looking so great. So, here is a map, and the United States is number four. That looks pretty good, right? Unfortunately, this is a map for world income inequality, and the United States is the fourth worst country in terms of income inequality, which sucks. We're only behind Russia, Ukraine, and Lebanon. So, what is income inequality, and why is it so bad? So, in the United States, 90% of our population makes an average income of $33,000 a year. That's in comparison to the top 0.1% of our population which makes an income of over $6 billion a year. So what's so bad about that? What's so bad about when people make a lot of money? You may be saying, oh, maybe they're smarter than me. Maybe they made better decisions in life. Maybe they went to more school. Maybe they're more um, you know, fluent in economic matters. Well, that's true, maybe they are, but there's also a lot of problems with being very, very rich. So people who have a lot of money are often defended by saying they create jobs. Um, that may have been the case in the past, but with um, the late 1970s and the early 1980s, we saw a really big shift towards a globalized market and um, some larger companies with less amount of employees. Take Craigslist for um, instance. Craigslist employs 30 people, and they make millions of dollars in revenue every year. Their CEO is worth $40 million. Um, and the problem with Craigslist is that prior to Craigslist, when it was invented in the 1990s, was that it replaced a lot of jobs. So there used to be real estate brokers, and more pawn shops, and more thrift shops, and um, more advertising firms. But with the advent of Craigslist, we don't need so many of those. Um, another problem with the upper class being so wealthy is that uh, they're not spending all their money. You can only buy so many mansions. You can only um, purchase so many yachts. You can only employ so many people to clean your house. You will never spend the amount of money you're making. Um, they also store a lot of their money away in foreign nations like the Cayman Islands and um, in Panama and in Mexico, so that money's not being taxed. In fact, our tax rates for the wealthy have gone down a lot. Currently, they're being taxed around 40%. When Reagan was president, it was 28%. And then when Eisenhower was president, it was around 94%. And Eisenhower was by no means a liberal president. But um, if the wealthy class is not spending their money, and they're not being taxed on it, 
and they're not creating new jobs, what are they doing to help our economy? Really, not much, but who is helping our economy? Who spends the majority of their income? Who purchases a lot of money? It's the middle class, it's us. We, the middle class is what drives our economy to grow. And currently, the middle class um, is shrinking because of income inequality growing. And um, this is a picture of the middle class. And as you can see, at times when income inequality is really high, we usually have an economic um, down point right after that. So the crash of the 1930s depression and then the 2008 recession both happened after periods of high income inequality. When the income um, inequality is low and the middle class is large, like in the 1950s. So when Eisenhower was president, um, our middle class was really large. We had an economic growth of 37% and the middle class had 30% purchasing power and um, inflation was really low and we had a lot of people getting jobs and coming back from war and making a lot of big decisions. Um, it was called the age of prosperity. This whole section from here to here is considered the age of prosperity because we have low income in, uh, inequality and our country was generally considered wealthy and prosperous and one of the best countries in the world. So um, what was one thing that they did back in 19, uh, the 1950s, 60s that really helped our middle class go? Well, they invested in education. So after World War II, uh, a lot of people came back from the war and they couldn't find jobs. So we created the GI Bill. And the GI Bill um, basically gave war veterans an easy way to access education in a cheap way. So we paid for a lot of people to get education and then we had an entire new influx of people who were able to get higher paying jobs and contribute more to the economy. Um, currently, in the United States, education is not so great. Um, our cost of education is rising far above the cost of inflation. As you can see here, this is inflation and this is education. Um, if you look at your cost of education and you look at your parents' cost of education, you can definitely tell there is a big difference and it's a lot harder for you to pay for education than it is for them. Um, now, this is a big problem because our college graduates are graduating with a lot of student loans. And generally, people who have a lot of debt don't like to spend money. And um, so we're not buying houses and we're not buying cars and this is being seen in people as old as 30 years old who have graduated from college. So this is a graph of delinquency on loans and people are defaulting on loans as small as $3,000 and $5,000 because they just can't afford to pay them. Um, home equity lo uh, loans are going down, mortgages, um, car, uh, car payments, and of course your student loans. So. How does this affect the rest of the economy, not just us? Well, it affects the rest of the economy because young college borrowers can't afford to make new payments. So we're not buying clothes, we're not buying a lot of food, we're not contributing to our economy. Also, we are not um, buying new houses, we're living with our parents. So baby boomers who are trying to sell their houses and move into retirement homes can't sell them because we're not buying them. Also, we're not getting married, so we're not having kids, and we're not contributing to population growth, and creating new buildings, and introducing new people to the world. And also, we're picking careers that help us, but maybe not the general population. So we're all going into engineering, and we're all going into um, law, but nobody's really going into art and humanities, which even though they may not have a big salary, they really help the economy because people buy art, people read books. So people are saying that the next big economic crash is not a housing bubble, it's a student loan bubble. Um, and we're getting closer and closer to another recession and we're not recovering from the previous one because people aren't paying loans. So what I'm basically saying is that we can't afford to not invest in the middle class. The middle class needs us to put money into it so that it can help recover and grow and become 
what the United States used to be, which was a really big economic powerhouse. Um, so the next election for the next, or any election that you get to in the future, maybe don't invest in the top four countries, top percent, top 0.1% who might be able to get you money in the future. Invest in yourself. Invest in the 90% who have proven to help our country and who um, help our country grow by getting new jobs and produce and buying more. So invest in yourself. Okay, so I guess that's all that we have for today, correct? Okay, so we had some great speeches today, um, but as we close, I have one last joke, because that's what we're here for, of course. I actually had the, I actually had the final one, because this one was really good. All right, so it's, it's kind of like a Bible joke. So, the Lord, so the Lord said unto John, come forth and you will receive everlasting life. But John came fifth and received the toaster. Okay. So that's my joke. Ha uh ha. -huh. Think about it. And if you're gonna eat now, you're you know, you're tired. Think now. And that's it. So we're done. Thank you. you can go back to two oh two. So you can leave the chairs here, we'll just keep them there for tomorrow. Let's go back to two oh two. Good job today.